Well, friends, defendant Donald Trump indicted on 34 felony counts in New York makes his first court appearance. Let's talk about that because justice matters. Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here. So friends, it was quite a day, wasn't it? Donald Trump made his first court appearance. He is now Defendant Trump. Let's make sure we always refer to him moving forward as Defendant Trump. He was arraigned on an indictment that included 34 felony crimes. 34 felonies for falsifying business records in his determination to steal the presidency in 2016. And what we saw unsealed today, both in the indictment and the statement of facts that accompanied the indictment, was a massive conspiracy, a massive scheme to basically defraud the voters of the United States by concealing deeply damaging information and evidence about Donald Trump's unsuitability to be a candidate for the presidency. And interesting side note, each of the 34 counts carries a maximum punishment of four years in prison. So that would add up to what, 136 years? Trump wouldn't be eligible for parole until he's about, I don't know, 173. No, he obviously wouldn't get a sentence, you know, of a hundred and some odd years. But this ain't no misdemeanor, right? People were complaining, all the Trump loyalists and flunkies and lackeys, oh, this, these are just misdemeanor crimes. You know, this is like some sort of a, a, a reporting error. Maybe you put the decimal in the wrong place. No, 34 felony crimes, all committed with the goal of basically, you know, robbing us of our right to a free and fair 2016 presidential election. Let's look at the opening salvo in the statement of facts that was unsealed today that accompanies the 34 count indictment. The defendant, Donald Trump, repeatedly and fraudulently falsified New York business records to conceal criminal conduct that hid damaging information from the voting public during the 2016 presidential election. From August 2015 to December 2017, defendant Trump orchestrated a scheme with others to influence the 2016 presidential election by identifying and purchasing negative information about him to suppress its publication and benefit the defendant's electoral prospects. In order to execute the unlawful scheme, the participants violated election laws and made and caused false entries in the business records of various entities in New York. The participants also took steps that mischaracterized for tax purposes the true nature of the payments made in furtherance of the criminal scheme. So friends, we'll spend a lot of time going through this indictment, going through the statement of facts, and I certainly want to take up some of what unfolded in that New York courtroom today. For example, the prosecutors talked a lot about the threats that Donald Trump had been making, had been posting against, among others, the New York District Attorney Alvin Bragg, and about how he was promising death and destruction if he's indicted you know, threatening World War III. But the prosecutors stopped short of requesting, formally requesting a gag order or any limitation on Donald Trump's speech or posts. I wanna talk about that probably in a video tomorrow and drill down on what I see going on here and how it might play out moving forward. Frankly, I was a little disappointed that the prosecutors didn't formally request some sort of restriction on Donald Trump's dangerous speech. 
But what I want to take on in today's Justice Matters video is just some of what I'm seeing in this indictment that frankly was a little surprising and mainly in a good way. Now we knew all along that Michael Cohen was going to be a testifying witness at trial against Donald Trump. He testified a couple of times in the grand jury. He has been talking publicly about how he committed these crimes, some of these crimes, at the direction of, for the benefit of, and with Donald Trump. He pleaded guilty, he went to prison, he was punished, he was held accountable, and Donald Trump wasn't. That is a deep and inexcusable injustice. Of course, we also recently learned from the former district attorney in Manhattan, Cy Vance, that when he was investigating these crimes and Donald Trump's potential complicity in these crimes, Donald Trump's Department of Justice told him to stand down. Yeah, we're going to be talking more about that in the future. But we knew all along Michael Cohen was going to be a trial witness against Donald Trump. But some of what we learned in court today makes it pretty clear that there may be some other witnesses who are going to end up being just as important who may testify against Donald Trump. Now, first of all, the documentary evidence here is strong. The, the false business records themselves and the reimbursement checks signed by Donald Trump out of the Oval Office, fraudulently asserting they were for, you know, uh, legal services. He was writing these checks to Michael Cohen, when in reality, they were to reimburse Michael Cohen for the $130,000 hush money payment that Michael Cohen made out of his own pocket for the benefit of Donald Trump. The, the documentary evidence, the physical evidence is compelling. Michael Cohen's testimony as corroborated, supported, affirmed by the documentary evidence is compelling. But boy, we got some clues in today's indictment and statement of facts about some of the other witnesses who might also have been involved in this conspiracy and who therefore might end up testifying against Donald Trump. For example, David Pecker, the CEO of AMI, American Media Incorporated, that's the company that publishes the trashy tabloid, the National Enquirer. Well, what we learned or what we were reminded of is that, you know, David Pecker was deep in this corrupt mix. And in fact, AMI, his company, entered into a non-prosecution agreement with the prosecutors and said, yeah, we were part of this corrupt scheme. And some of what we learned in today's court hearing and the papers that were, were disclosed were unsealed included things like David Pecker had a meeting when Donald Trump was a candidate in 2016 with Donald Trump, and he said, quote, I'll be your eyes and ears, close quote. It's interesting that the indictment and the associated, um, the accompanying statement of facts quotes his words. What does that suggest? They talk to David Pecker. David Pecker may very well be a testifying witness against Donald Trump. And here's what David Pecker said. He said, I will be your eyes and ears. I will identify, catch, and kill damaging stories as part of this criminal scheme so that they don't negatively impact your candidacy. And he said, and by the way, I quote, will also publish negative stories about your opponent. That opponent goes unnamed, but we know that opponent is Hillary Clinton. So David Pecker agreed to enter into this criminal scheme with Donald Trump to catch and kill negative stories about him while at the same time publishing deeply negative stories about Donald Trump's opponent. What these people did was they did their nefarious best to undermine our free and fair election in 2016. And that's not only criminal, it's despicable and un-American and anti-democratic and dangerous. And it looks like based on what we learned, David Pecker may not be prosecuted for it, but he may end up being a witness against Donald Trump. 
Okay, friends, let's turn our attention to Alan Weisselberg, the criminal chief financial officer for Donald Trump and his organization. You'll probably recall Alan Weisselberg pleaded guilty to a 15-year-long criminal scheme to defraud in the first degree, a massive tax fraud scheme that he and others ran out of the Trump Organization. Of course, he pleaded guilty, became sort of a cooperating witness, though to be clear, he was one of those cooperators that I would say was playing the 50s. He had one foot in the Manhattan DA camp and one foot remained firmly planted in the Trump Organization. He seemed to do the bare minimum. He did testify against the Trump Organization in that criminal trial, and the organization was convicted across the board of the same 15-year-long criminal scheme to defraud in the first degree. And of course, Alan Weisselberg is now doing a bit over in Rikers as a result of his conviction, his guilty plea, and boy, he makes a couple of appearances in this new indictment and statement of facts, and it is absolutely clear he's a co-conspirator in these crimes as well. Frankly, my favorite passage in the statement of facts concerning Alan Weisselberg, there was a meeting between Weisselberg and Michael Cohen, who was also part of the conspiracy, and um, there were some notes taken on a bank statement by which they were kind of you know, going through the calculations of their criminal scheme, how much Michael Cohen would have to be repaid by Donald Trump and the Trump Organization for paying out of his own pocket the hush money to Stormy Daniels. And the statement of fact says that Alan Weisselberg memorialized these calculations, let's be clear, these were criminal calculations in handwritten notes on the copy of the bank statement that Michael Cohen provided. In other words, Alan, we've got your criminal doodles in your own handwriting. Ah, oh, it's a beautiful thing from this old prosecutor's perspective. So here's what I suspect might be going on with Alan Weisselberg. We don't know precisely, but it feels like he may have some additional crimin criminal culpability for the hush money payments. And it looks like Alvin Bragg might be in a position to say, uh, Alan, you know, we've got you again. Do you want to testify against Donald Trump? Do you want to fully cooperate this time instead of playing the 50s? Or would you like us to indict you again and perhaps you can do a second stretch in Rikers. That may be what's going on, but what's clear from this indictment and this statement of facts is that Alan Weisselberg is a co-conspirator. And friends, let's not forget, we've all heard the undercover recording, the covert recording that Michael Cohen made when he was discussing this illegal hush money payment scheme with Donald Trump. And they were openly discussing how Alan Weisselberg was part of it, was assisting so, yes, again, from the perspective of this old former prosecutor, this case looks strong, both on the documentary evidence and on the testimonial evidence. Now, unfortunately, we learned that the next court appearance, the next court hearing in the case isn't going to be until December. I don't know why it's so far out. I do know that New York allows for a pretty robust motions practice before a case ever goes to trial. So. I suspect they'll be filing motions and the prosecutors will be filing replies to those motions. Oral arguments will be set, but, you know, let's face it, this trial is not going to come to fruition until well into 2024. Of course, by then, friends, Donald Trump will have been indicted in other cases, in other jurisdictions, in my opinion, based on what we know of Fawny Willis's investigation down in Fulton County, Georgia, based on what we know of special counsel Jack Smith's multiple criminal investigations that are picking up speed like nobody's business in Washington, D.C. So even though Donald Trump 
is indicted first in New York, I have a feeling he will be tried first somewhere other than New York, and that's fine, as long as the Trump trials get underway. Because justice matters. Friends, it was a good day for accountability. Please stay safe. Please stay tuned. And I look forward to talking with you all again soon.